Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us again today for the daily update. Um, I want to start, as always, with an update on some of the key statistics in relation to COVID-19. As at nine o'clock this morning, I can report that there have been 13,627 positive cases confirmed. That is an increase of 141 from yesterday. A total of 1,453 patients are currently in hospital with either confirmed or suspected cases of the virus, and that is a decrease of 31 from yesterday. A total of 80 people last night were in intensive care with confirmed or suspected COVID-19, and that is a decrease of two since yesterday. I'm also able to confirm that since the 5th of March, a total of 3,114 patients who had tested positive for the virus have now been able to leave hospital, which of course is very happy and positive news. Unfortunately, though, I have to report that in the past 24 hours, five deaths have been registered of patients who had been confirmed through a test as having COVID-19. That takes the total number of deaths in Scotland under that measurement to 1,862. I want to emphasise again today that those figures should uh, be treated with some caution. Although deaths can now be registered at weekends, registration numbers at weekends are usually relatively low and they can be particularly low following a Sunday. So this should be taken into account when considering today's figures. And as I always do and as I always will, um, I want to stress that these numbers are not just statistics and should never be seen as that they represent individuals whose loss has been felt deeply by all of their loved ones. And I want to send again today my deepest condolences to everyone who is grieving as a result of this virus. I also want to thank, uh, again, as I always do, our health and care workers. You're doing extraordinary work going above and beyond the extra mile in incredibly challenging circumstances. And all of us owe you a huge debt of gratitude. And I and everyone in the Scottish Government is deeply grateful to you for everything you are doing. In a moment, I'm going to ask the Health Secretary to set out the details of a new wellbeing programme which is being launched today. That's a new programme to support the mental health of those working in our health and care sector at this difficult time. Uh, but before that, there are two items I want to briefly address. Uh, firstly, the Scottish Government has today, just in the last wee while, published our second coronavirus bill. Uh, that proposed legislation includes a range of further measures to help Scotland through this pandemic. And amongst many other things, it provides additional support for unpaid carers. It ensures that carers' allowance recipients will receive an extra payment on top of the carers' allowance supplement that is paid to unpaid carers in Scotland. And this new payment will see around 83,000 carers receive an additional £230 uh, next month to support them through this difficult period. Uh, being a carer is incredibly demanding at the best of times, and I know that it is much more difficult right now. So I want to thank each and every one of Scotland's unpaid carers for the incredibly important role that you are playing. Uh, the bill is due to go through the Scottish Parliament in the next two weeks, and I hope that when it does, this additional payment, alongside the other support that we are providing, helps to make things just a little bit easier for you. The second item I want to cover today concerns the lockdown restrictions. Uh, last night, the Prime Minister set out some of the detail of his plan for easing restrictions in England. Uh, more of the detail of that has emerged this morning and will continue to come out during the course of today. I want to reiterate that those announcements uh, do not apply yet here in Scotland. Uh, that is not, uh, let me stress, for any political reason. It is because the Scottish Government is not yet confident that these changes can be made safely in Scotland yet without running the risk of the virus potentially running out of control again. So Scotland's lockdown restrictions remain in place for now and our key message remains the same. We need you to stay at home. We do not at this point want to see more businesses opening up or more people going to work. We do not yet want to see more people using public transport and we are not yet changing who can or should be at school. 
The only change we've made here in Scotland is to the guidance on exercise. As I said yesterday, as of today, we've removed the once a day limit on exercise. It means that if you want to go for a walk more than once a day or to go for a run and also a walk, you can now do so. That change doesn't apply if you or someone in your household has symptoms of the virus or if you received a letter explaining that you are in the shielded group. In these cases, you should still stay at home completely. For everybody else, uh, you still need to stay relatively close to your own home while exercising. And at all times, please stay at least two metres away from people from other households. I also want to stress that by exercise, we mean activities like walking or running or cycling, uh, not at this stage, sunbathing or having a picnic. Uh, this really doesn't give people a license to meet up at the park or at the beach. It is one very minor change, but I think a, an important change to the existing rules. But all of the restrictions in Scotland for now remain in place. And let me uh, just reflect for a moment on why this matters. Uh, I read this morning, as many of you might have done in the Glasgow Evening Times, the tragic story of a family from Castle Milk in Glasgow. Andy Leoman has told how his mum, dad and father-in-law have all died from this virus. And he talks too of the impact on his nine-year-old daughter. Their story is heartbreaking. Uh, it's heartbreaking for them. But what all of us should reflect on is that it could be any one of us. That family have told their story because they want people to listen to the advice that we are giving. In today's paper, they say this, people need to realise it's real. The guidelines that are set out need to be followed. It may be them next and their families, and we would not want anyone to go through what we have had to go through. Stay in the house, social distance. That is the way to keep people you love safe. I think that is a very powerful message and it underlines the importance of the restrictions and why we need to stick with them for now. So to close today, I want to reiterate simply and I hope clearly what the restrictions continue to be while our progress against this potentially deadly virus remains fragile. Except for essential purposes such as exercise, buying food or medicines or going to do essential work that you can't do from home, you shouldn't be going out, you should stay at home. If you do go out, you should stay more than two metres from other people and not meet up with people from other households. You should wear a face covering if you are in a shop or in public transport, and you should isolate completely if you or someone else in your household has symptoms. I know that these restrictions continue to be extremely tough, and I know that hearing talk about easing the lockdown makes them seem probably even tougher. But please, I am asking you for now to stick with it. We are making progress. The figures I've reported to you today give further evidence of that. But to combat this virus, we still need to stay apart from each other. We still need to stay at home. And the thing is, the more we do that now, the sooner we will be able to ease more of these restrictions. I set out yesterday the further changes that we are considering making as soon as we judge it safe to do so. We all want to see our friends and families. We all miss them more with each day that passes. We all want to see children get back to school and we all desperately want to get back to some kind of normality. Uh, please know that I want all of that too. I want that as your First Minister, but actually I also want it as an ordinary person who is missing my own family very much indeed. But I know that we will get there more quickly if we all keep doing the right thing now. If we take our foot off the brake too soon, the real danger is that we will end up in this lockdown for longer. And worst of all, we will lose many more people along the way. None of us want that. So please be patient and please try not to get distracted by messages from other parts of the UK. All governments across the UK are trying to do the right thing. And all of us have a responsibility to take the steps we think are right at the right time. So please, if you live in Scotland, abide by the law that applies here and follow Scottish Government guidelines. Uh, lastly today, I also want to make a, a respectful plea to the media. Uh, your scrutiny role is essential and you perform it robustly and rightly so. But at a time like this, when health is at stake, all of us have a public duty too. Please make it clear to your readers, listeners and viewers what the actual situation is in different parts of the UK. 
Moving at different speeds uh, in different parts of the UK for good evidence-based reasons need not be a cause for confusion. Indeed, other countries are also taking different steps in different areas at different times. Confusion only arises if we as politicians and the media who report on us are either unclear in what we are asking people to do or if we give a misleading impression, even by omission, that decisions that apply to one nation only are actually UK-wide. Never has the duty on political leaders to communicate clearly been greater. And in the provision of basic public health information, I hope the media will continue, as most of you have been doing already, to appreciate the importance of that too. Uh, this matters to all of us. If we do see continued high compliance with these restrictions in Scotland for a bit longer, we will continue to slow the spread of this virus, we will protect the NHS and we will save lives and we will all uh, move more quickly to the day that these restrictions start to be eased. So thank you once again to all of you uh, for doing everything that you are doing. Uh, I'll hand over now to the Chief Medical Officer who's going to say a few words and then as I indicated a few moments ago, the Health Secretary is going to set out a package of uh, wellbeing support for those who work in our health and care sector. Thank you, First Minister. So today I want to speak to you about a clinical issue that's very important, and that's the process of anticipated care planning, which I know can be a difficult subject for people to have conversations about. It's not a new concept, and it's been done in clinical care for many, many years. Our current understanding is that 80% of people who are affected by COVID-19 illness will have mild symptoms. However, a small number will become seriously ill and require more intensive clinical management. There's a group of people who are at much higher risk of becoming seriously unwell from coronavirus, and for that matter, other infections and health problems too. This group should be prioritised for anticipated care planning. Anticipated care planning provides an important opportunity for people to have conversations with carers and loved ones about the type of care that they would like to receive should they become unwell. It is this conversation and the expression of what's important to them in their care that's the important thing. The document that comes out of these conversations simply records it for others to see. So it must be done sensitively and with the quality of these conversations at the forefront of people's minds. We know that treatments for coronavirus focus on supportive measures and that some specific care options like ventilation are of low benefit or do not help people who are already in poor health. However, there are many other aspects of care that can be discussed and planned. People may well be worried about the future, and so there's an opportunity to have a helpful conversation about what matters most to them if they become very unwell or require end-of-life care. These discussions can be extremely difficult to start, but they are important. The aim is to have an open and honest conversation with individuals, their families and carers, so that we can plan future care that matters to people as well as possible. One particularly challenging example of this is asking people about whether or not they would want to be given CPR in the event their, ha their heart should stop beating. It's a difficult conversation to have and it needs to be done sensitively and only if the person wants this conversation and at a time that is right for them. Some people may have very clear views about what they would want and not want to happen to them. Others may not. It's important to offer people the opportunity to talk about this when they're ready to do so. Each of these are decisions which must be taken on a person-by-person -person basis, weighing up all the risks and benefits led by the person's own wishes. Having these conversations in anticipation allows people to think about what choices they would wish to make in the event that decisions need to be made. These are some of the most sensitive and challenging conversations that people can have, and they're often not easy for clinicians either. But when they're done well, they contribute massively to good personalised care. When I think of some of the most important conversations that I've had with patients over the years, it's often these type of conversations that come to mind. They're a privilege for a clinician to have when done properly, and they create lasting impressions because they're about the core issues that people base their lives on. So they must be undertaken on the basis of trust, sensitivity, and honesty at all times. That's the basis on which good anticipatory planning is founded. Um, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you. Today I want to address Scotland's health and social care workforce. Every Thursday we all stand and applaud 
in appreciation of the work you are doing to keep us safe and well. That gesture of support is important, and I know that it is hugely appreciated. The scale of the challenge you are facing is unprecedented. Many of you will be working in unfamiliar roles. Many of you will be asked to learn new skills or work in unfamiliar ways. At the same time, you are caring for your own family. You may be personally affected by COVID-19, and you will undoubtedly have your own anxieties and worries. That makes it all the more important that as you look after us, we do everything we can to look after you. We've already taken a number of practical steps with our partners, looking to make sure that there is access to food supplies, to public transport, to free parking, to temporary accommodation if needed. And we've made the guidance on PPE as clear as possible, working with National Services Scotland and others to make sure <clears throat> that the PPE that you need gets to you when you need it. This hasn't always been easy uh, or perfect, but we are absolutely committed to getting it right and fixing the glitches that arise as we go. But supporting and protecting the mental well-being of our workforce is also a priority. At the end of March, my colleague Claire Hockey, our Minister for Mental Health, wrote to all our NHS boards, local authorities and health and social care partnerships, asking them to take steps to improve mental health and well-being support for staff that made sense locally. Since then, significant examples have taken place, significant activity at a local level. I want to give two brief examples. In Lanarkshire, the NHS and the partnership set up a local 24-hour helpline for staff accessible to all health and social care staff, including those working in the care sector, in care homes and the third sector and well-being hubs with chill-out zones in various locations and an access to a range of digital mental health and self-care resources. NHS Grampian has a telephone helpline in place, service that is available uh, seven days a week, and a psychological resilience hub open seven days a week for all staff across the health and social care and third sector. Two examples of support that reflect what has happened across the country from our health boards and our social care partnerships and our local authorities, everything from making sure that hot meals are available to creating quiet spaces where people can go and simply draw breath. Now, adding to that, this morning we've launched a new national wellbeing hub for the whole health and social care workforce. The hub can be accessed at www promise.scot, that's promise, P-R-O-M-I-S, dot Scott. The hub is the first of its kind in the UK. Based on a psychological first aid approach, the hub provides advice on self-care and services to promote emotional and psychological well-being and address practical concerns. It also provides access to a bespoke digital coaching service to support health, well-being and resilience. With video clips sharing messages of support and experiences of those working and caring during the pandemic, you'll also find information to address the challenges we've heard about working and health and social care at this time. These include concerns for personal safety and that of family members, involvement in end of life care and decision making, working in unfamiliar roles and settings, and the real and often overpowering feelings of grief and upset. Finally, the hub contains information for health and social care organisations to help them support their workforce. PROMISE is a collaborative project between NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde's Anchor Service and NHS Lothian's Rivers Centre, who host the hub. And I want to thank them for hosting the hub and the many health and social care partners across Scotland who have worked together to make the hub a reality. The opening of this is a significant step forward in supporting our health and social care workforce. But as Health Secretary, let me be clear, I will never say that we have done enough. So we will continue to look at what more we can do in this area and in others, working with our partners, working to make sure that we understand your concerns 
we understand what we need, you need, and we act to make sure that happens. Thank you. Thank you very much, Health Secretary. I hope you agree, given everything health and care staff have been dealing with in recent weeks, that it was important to firstly establish this service and for the Health Secretary to set out uh, detail of that today. Um, can I now go to questions from journalists? Uh, and first up today, Glenn Campbell from the BBC. First Minister, the Scottish Secretary estimates that in Scotland we are perhaps a matter of days behind other parts of the UK in suppressing coronavirus. Is that an assessment you share? And on a point of clarification, if you live in somewhere like Annan and work in Carlisle and can't do your job from home, should you feel free to go back to work? Um, I'll, I'll come on to uh, the second point. I, I don't know what the Secretary of State for Scotland is basing uh, that comment on, so uh, I guess in the first instance you would have to ask him. Uh, what I've said before, and, and will speak for myself again here, is that based on our assessment of the R number, uh, we think that we are uh, slightly higher than the rest of the UK. It, certainly uh, the rest of the UK on average, it may be that there are uh, variations within England, but certainly uh, slightly, slightly above uh, in terms of a comparison with England. And that would suggest that we are slightly behind in terms of the infection curve, which given that our first cases were identified and confirmed later, it would make some sense. But whether you can put a, a set number of days on that, um, I think is, is much more uncertain. Um, but what I've said uh, also is that I will want to look uh, very closely at the data that emerges in the coming days, uh, the, the data around case numbers, uh, hospital admissions, ICU admissions, and uh, particularly the NRS figures that will come on Wednesday on numbers of deaths uh, to give me greater confidence that the, the virus is on a sustained downward trend and that we then hopefully will see the R number uh, reduce uh, as well in Scotland. So that's the, the data I want to look at to give uh, confidence that as we start to ease restrictions, we are not immediately going to see a resurgence of the virus that would tip us over that all-important one uh, number in in terms of, of R. Um, for, for people in Scotland, if you live in Scotland, uh, the law in Scotland applies. Um, and Or if you are in Scotland, the law in Scotland applies. And the law says right now that you can only uh, be out of your own home for essential reasons, which is essential work uh, that can be done at home, uh, getting food, getting medicine or exercise. And we've changed the guidance uh, today to say that exercise now can be several times a day as opposed to just once a day. Uh, so if you live in the Scottish borders uh, and you go, uh, you, you come across the border uh, to go to the supermarket, something you would do routinely, then you would uh, certainly uh, not be breaking the law if you were getting uh, food. That's an essential purpose. If you live just south of the border, but you work in an essential job and Dumfries and Galloway Hospital, for example. Uh, equally, that is perfectly legitimate. But if you are coming uh, into Scotland for reasons that are uh, not covered uh, by those essential purposes, then uh, you potentially would be in, in breach of the law. So these things are reasonably straightforward when you uh, consider the detail and when you uh, listen to, to the messages that have been given. Um, and if you live in Scotland uh, right now, then my, if you're not working at the moment or if you're working from home uh, right now, then my advice is that you should continue with that right now. We are not encouraging more people to go back to work right at the moment. We do want to get businesses open and operational again as quickly as possible. Uh, but we must make sure, firstly, we've got confidence uh, in the, the data that tells us we're not going to have a resurgence of the virus and make sure that all of the guidance is in place to give workers confidence that they will be safe when they go back to work. And that is the kind of uh, discussion and dialogue and work that is underway uh, between the Scottish Government and different sectors of the economy right now. Uh, Ewan Petrie from STV. First Minister, just picking up on what you said towards the end there, you, you say you don't want to see more businesses opening up at this stage in Scotland, but you're not compelling manufacturers and construction firms who are not carrying out essential work to stay closed. So if these companies can demonstrate they can put the necessary health and safety procedures in place, when can they consider getting back up and running? 
Well, we are having those discussions with different sectors. We will be setting out sectoral guidance uh, in the near future. Uh, I said last week that we are looking um, as uh, priorities at construction, manufacturing and retail. That work is underway. Uh, Certainly, I know that in the construction sector, the, the industry leadership group has also been doing some work about a, a phased restart. In terms of the position of the Scottish Government, it has not changed. So from the outset here, we have in regulations uh, categories of business that are required by law to close. We have at the other end of the spectrum businesses that we know we need to see operational because they are uh, crucial to the critical infrastructure of the country or to keeping food on the table and the lights on. Uh, the companies uh, between those uh, two ends of the spectrum, we have issued guidance uh, and asked them to consider certain factors. Are they uh, doing work that is essential or material to the well-being of the country? Uh, if so, can they allow workers to work from home? Um, and if not, can they put in place social distancing? And if they can answer these questions uh, affirmatively, then they should not be open. That guidance is the same today as it was yesterday. And if any individual company wants uh, further uh, guidance or, or further help, we can't give bespoke guidance for every single company, but we will do our best to help companies with those decisions as we put in place guidance for the restart that we all want to see as soon as it is safe to do so. Uh, James Matthews from Sky. Thanks very much, First Minister. You were asked about Scotland's R number yesterday. Uh, the key to progress is a reduction in the R number. Your opponents have written to you today asking if you will publish what Scotland's R number is. Can you tell me who knows what Scotland's R number is and why aren't they telling us? I've already published it. Uh, all of these uh, assessments will... Well, James, if, if you allow me to answer, you might get the answer. Um, but all of these assessments come with a range. Uh, so we've said the, the advice we have right now is that it's between 0.7 and 1. Um, and we will continue to look at the data to see how that changes. Remember, at the start of this, the R number was probably well in excess of 3. So it has come down. That's we already published uh, the, the, the range of the estimate that we are able to give. Uh, I'm not keeping information from people here. I'm as anxious to see all of these indicators go in the downward direction as everybody else is so that we can start to get back to normal. But we must uh, do that in a way that gives, in which we have more confidence than we do just now, that it's not so close to one uh, that it will immediately tip over uh, the edge. So we are looking at all of these things very closely. The data uh, that will uh, feed into the assessment of what the R number is, is the kind of data we look at very closely on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. So, uh, you know, these are uh, things that we have been very open uh, and transparent about and will continue to be. Um, and I think people watching at home would expect exactly that from the government as we take decisions that are unapologetically given the severity of this virus and the impact it can have, erring on the side of caution uh, so that we don't see it run out of control again too quickly. Uh, Peter Smith from ITV News. Thank you very much, First Minister. Um, you'd asked for confusion to be avoided and we've been contacted by a number of people this morning who are really confused. And I stress this isn't about trying to tie you guys in knots, it's about trying to give these people clarity. Particularly, I was contacted by one a gentleman who works in the construction industry. He lives in Scotland. His place of work in the construction industry is in England. He's been contacted and told that he's expected to be returning to work this week. He doesn't know that if he decides to go and he deems it a necessary journey to go because he wants to keep his job, will he be breaking the law in Scotland? He's also currently in furlough and his employer is taking people out of furlough. They're no longer claiming as part of the job retention scheme. So how is he going to live? If you want to pass the details of the individual, we will have a conversation directly with them and give uh, as much advice. I, I can't be clearer here that the position in Scotland has not changed. Uh, the position in England is, is changing and I think it is for uh, political leaders in England to set out the clarity of exactly what that means, which I know the Prime Minister is intending to do in the House of Commons later on. The position has not changed. Uh, we are uh, saying to businesses that have not been operational uh, so far that we are not encouraging you to go back to work uh, right now. The guidance of the, the things, if you're not in the group of 
uh, businesses that are required by law to close, the guidance is there for you to judge uh, these decisions and you should not be putting uh, workers under pressure to go back to work before uh, there is clarity about the safety of doing so. So the Scottish Government's position has not changed. It remains what it is and if there are individuals uh, who uh, are in the kind of position you talk about, we will give uh, as much clarity and as much support um, and information as we can and we will continue to set out the steps we take that help and support businesses and sectors come back as soon as it is safe to do so. What I don't think is right for any government to do is to say we're encouraging people to go back to work who haven't been uh, working so far before the guidance on what a safe working environment is has been published. Uh, that's the bit that should come first before anybody is encouraged to go back to work. I was just reading and uh, I, I will go back to, to looking at the detail of this when I leave this briefing, but some of the information that the ONS has published in England today about the, the, the uh, higher death rates in certain occupations. And we must be really careful here that we're not prematurely asking people to go back to work in the kinds of occupations where we, we already know uh, the, the, the impact of this virus has been greater before we can be sure and persuade workers that it is safe for them to do so. And that has to be done in a careful way and in a fully transparent way. And that's what the Scottish Government is going to continue to do. Uh, Peter? specifically asking about furlough money, though, because that's what he's living on at the moment. The, the furlough scheme is a UK government scheme. I don't think any uh, worker who is, is on furlough right now should be pressurised to go back to work before the guidance is in place and there is confidence about doing that. And it is not the Scottish government position uh, that that should happen. So let me be uh, very clear ab about that from the Scottish government's perspective. And what I would say to the UK government is that people should not be put under that kind of pressure. Uh, Peter McMahon from ITV Border. Uh, thank you, First Minister. Could I just seek some just complete clarity on this cross-border issue? Is it your advice that people who live in Scotland but work in England and have been asked to go back to work and whose employers say it's safe to do so, should they not go? Is it your advice they should not go to work uh, in Carlisle, for example? And if that's the case, will that be enforced? Because you seem to suggest that by doing so, they'd be breaking the law in Scotland. I'm going to take care not to, to, to go into uh, specifics where there, there, there could be a range of examples you give me here about different types of businesses where different uh, things would uh, perhaps be the case. But what I am saying very clearly is that the advice I was giving to people in Scotland uh, yesterday or on Saturday or at the end of last week has not changed. Um, it may be that advice that's been given elsewhere in the UK has changed, but if you are in Scotland, uh, then the, 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 the law that is in place and the guidance that is in place is the same today uh, as it was previously. And I would hope all uh, employers would respect that, and I would hope that governments in different parts of the UK, all of us, respect uh, the different uh, positions uh, that are in place for very good evidence-based reasons. Uh, Lindsay Hanna from Radio Clyde. Thanks, First Minister. Just back to what you were saying regarding construction firms there, you've said that the restrictions remain in force here. But what if firms decide to ignore that? What instructions have you given to the police for how they're going to deal with that? And who's going to stop them going back to work? Well, the guidance is very clear for businesses, and these are businesses uh, that are in the uh, category that I spoke about a moment ago that are not uh, prohibited by law from uh, being open, uh, but equally not in the critical uh, sector. The guidance to them is clear. That guidance in Scotland has not changed. Uh, businesses have been uh, very, very responsible in how they have behaved uh, thus far. And I would ask businesses to continue to, in Scotland, uh, or with workers in Scotland, to continue to follow and pay heed to the guidance in Scotland. We are working with construction, we are working with other sectors about getting uh, new guidance in place that allows them to go back to work safely. And um, I hope we can start to see that uh, process soon. But we have to, as I say, uh, be confident in the state of the virus before we do that. And it, in fairness to workers, we have to make sure that there is clear guidance in place about the safety of workplaces. There has, I think, been concern caused in uh, other parts of the UK today about workers being told that they are expected to go back to work before workplace guidance has, has been published. We've got to do these things the right way round if we are to build confidence that 
the things we are asking people to do are safe for them to do. We all want to get uh, the economy up and running as quickly as it is safe to do so. We want to get people back to work. We want to get children back to school. But we must do that in a way that doesn't risk a, a resurgence of this virus and a second uh, wave of it costing more lives. And we must do that in a way that builds people's confidence. These two things are absolutely essential. And that's why careful, considered decision making uh, is so important. And you know, these questions are all legitimate questions to ask me, but I would, I would stress again, the Scottish Government guidance has not changed and our position has not changed. And that's the message I would ask people in Scotland to continue to listen to and to hear. Uh, Phil McDonald from Global. Thank you, First Minister. The Scottish Police Federation have said that we're now possibly going to see more people flouting Scotland's stay-at-home guidance because the Prime Minister failed to mention that his advice on going to places like parks was specific to England. So what do you say to those officers who are going to have to deal with people who either don't know the difference or won't acknowledge it, particularly around their concerns on testing as well? Well, all of us have a responsibility to tell people in Scotland, England, Wales and Northern Ireland what the law says in these different countries. That responsibility is uh, certainly a, a big responsibility for politicians. I, I said last night, and I, I will say again, I think the Prime Minister has to make clearer uh, when he is talking only for England. Of course, he's the Prime Minister of the UK, and there are issues, border control being the example in his speech last night, where he is speaking for the whole UK. But these lockdown restrictions are, and this is not a political point, it's a point of law, they are in place separately in each of the UK nations. So all of us have to be very clear. Obviously, I am only speaking for Scotland, but I think given that he is the Prime Minister of the UK, he has to be very clear when he is announcing changes that are only uh, for England. And if we all do that, then there is no inevitability about confusion here. Uh, the media, as I said earlier, have a role to play in this as well. I saw a, a photograph in a, a, a UK newspaper this morning, which I, I won't name, uh, a photograph of a, a Scottish uh, beauty spot with the caption, from Wednesday, you can travel to beauty spots. Well, in Scotland, you can't travel to beauty spots from Wednesday. So it's really important for everybody who communicates with the public to be very clear about this. And if we all do that, then there is no inevitability about confusion. It's when we're not clear uh, that the confusion uh, kicks in or the risk of it kicks in. And the final point I would make is this. You know, there are, you look across Europe right now, you look to Germany, uh, the different lander in Germany are, are doing things at different speeds and no doubt they have their own evidence-based reasons for doing that. In Italy, different parts of Italy have a different restrictions lifted at different times. This is not unusual. Um, and it's really important that we recognise that. If these differences were being done for political reasons, that would be wrong. It is not the case uh, here that that is the, the motivation. They're being done because as First Minister of Scotland, I cannot yet say to you to look the Scottish people in the eye and say, I have the confidence to start lifting restrictions uh, to this extent without risking a resurgence of the virus. I hope that's different a week from now. Uh, I hope we'll be able to make even more progress two weeks from now. But I have to operate in that careful, considered, responsible way because that's the duty I owe to people in Scotland when we are talking about critical health and life and death matters. Uh, Neil Pruden from PA. Thanks, First Minister. Uh, on, the ONS, on the ONS data, which uh, was released today, I think you mentioned it earlier in your uh, response to Peter, um, it shows that in England and Wales, uh, bus drivers, chefs, uh, taxi drivers are some of the professions most at risk from COVID-19 deaths. Uh, is similar research going on in Scotland on which professions are most at risk? And could that affect which parts of the economy uh, restart at which point? Well, we're keen to provide as much information about the impact of the virus as possible. I'll hand over to Gregor about some of the work that is underway to provide uh, that greater detail. So there's work going on led by Public Health Scotland just now in National Records Scotland just to see exactly how we can develop further information on a variety of different topics. Uh, some of that is about ethnicity, some of that is about the kind of background occupations and where we record that and where we can take that information from. Um, we, we also get further information from um, various research studies which are in place within Scotland, which have been commissioned as well to try to better understand exactly the impact that this has in different 
forms of uh, society. And there's a lot of the information that we can directly extrapolate from the learning from documents like the ONS have published this morning as well. All that will be taken into consideration as we start to form guidance in this country. Okay, thanks. Gina Davidson from the Scotsman. Hi, thanks, First Minister. Um, the R number is uh, what you keep telling us all is, is vital in terms of uh, knowing when lockdown restrictions can be eased in Scotland. Uh, we know that you've ramped up capacity for testing, but is it still at less than a third of capacity that's being used? And if that's the case, you know, how, what is the plan I'm for sorry, Gina, the you, testing? You, you were breaking up there. I didn't hear the middle of your question. Sorry. I shall repeat it. Can you hear me now? Um, I was asking about testing capacity and the R number, which is, as you say, what's vital to know in, in terms of easing any kind of lockdown restrictions. And yet it's, it was reported at the weekend that just a third of the capacity that you've built into the testing is being used. What, what is the plan for increasing that? and therefore knowing exactly what where R is and when things can change. Well, I think you're confusing two different things there. And, and can I say, the R number is not what I say is important. It's what literally every, or maybe not literally every, but what many experts in most countries in the world say is uh, important in terms of making sure we, we've sufficiently suppressed a virus. We are. We have built up our testing capacity. I reported uh, the latest figures on capacity on Friday. We are also uh, increasing the numbers of people that are being tested. We've expanded the categories of testing. We have two, uh, of course, broadly speaking, uh, strands to our testing programme, the NHS testing programme and uh, the drive-through centres that are part of the UK wide network. So we uh, combine the two figures from that and we are increasing uh, testing numbers. Uh, we are also now, uh, uh, as an extension to that, but it is, is, is also apart from that to some extent, uh, building towards the Test Trace Isolate uh, initiative uh, which we set out a paper on last week um, and that work is underway. So testing is a critical part of what we're doing now. It will be a critical part of what we do in the future. Uh, but the calculation of the R number is, is separate to that, although part of uh, what we do through testing is surveillance and we will hopefully get some more uh, data from our surveillance testing to feed into the decisions that we are making over the next uh, week or so. Uh, Christine Lavelle from The Sun. Thanks, First Minister. Um, you previously refused to echo Boris Johnson's declaration that we're past the peak of the virus. Um, can you say now if Scotland is past the peak? And if not, can you explain why? Um, I, I didn't refuse to echo Boris Johnson. I, I Forgive me, I chose my own words, which I, I kind of think it's important for somebody in my position to do. Um, what I said then, and I, I suppose it is still what I worry about. So in terms of the technicalities of past the peak, when you, as we've been trying to do, flatten the curve, you don't necessarily get a single peak. You have a, a flattening. So you, you might have a plateauing for a period of time. So we've got to, I think, just one, you know, be careful about some of the technical terms that we are using. What I think all of the data shows us is that we are clearly on a downward trajectory of the virus in this phase, but we need to see more data to give us confidence that that is certain and that we have suppressed it sufficiently. What I uh, expressed concern about previously, and it's still my concern, is that we use language that people hear, whatever the technical uh, meaning that we are intending from that language, we use language that people hear as the danger has passed, there's no reason for us to follow this advice anymore, and therefore we can just go back to normal. That's what I'm expressing caution over. And the reason I'm expressing caution over that is because I know how much progress we have made. I know how hard it has been to make that. You know, remember, even if we uh, you know, take the, the most pessimistic end of the estimate of R now, it's around one. That is compared to above and possibly well above three at the start of this. So we have made progress. There's a lot of sacrifices that all of you have made to get us there. I don't want us to sacrifice it at this final hurdle right now. So let's keep going for just a bit longer to solidify that progress and then allow us to ease these restrictions with sufficient headroom that we're not immediately going to see everything going backwards. So I know I'm asking for a lot, but just a bit more patience and a bit more sacrifice from all of us will put us into a much stronger position to then start to 
ease these restrictions in a way that is orderly um, and that uh, allows us to, to keep going in that direction rather than uh, in a way that perhaps just risks everything that we have just achieved together. So that's why, uh, and I, again, I make no apology for being just a bit cautious in all of this because I don't, I don't like standing up here each and every day uh, announcing figures of people who have died. I, I really don't. It's the worst thing I've ever had to do. Um, and I know it's really horrible for people listening to it, and it is particularly horrible for those who have lost loved ones. So I don't want to play Russian roulette with any of this. I want to get us to a position where we feel confident about starting to ease this. And as I say, people will judge uh, whether that's right or wrong, but I make no apology for it. Uh, Vivian Aitken from the Daily Record. Good afternoon, First Minister. I'm taking you back to what you said yesterday about clarity of message from leaders was really important. And we've already touched on this earlier. Um, any Scots who were taking in the Prime Minister's broadcast last night who hadn't seen your earlier broadcast may be forgiven for thinking that his relaxation of rules applies to them. Therefore, has Boris Johnson put Scottish lives at risk with this unclear messaging? As I did yesterday and as I will do every single day I'm dealing with this, I'm going to resist having words put into my mouth that make for, you know, nice, he or not nice, but dramatic headlines, but actually don't help in the tackling of this virus. Boris Johnson is taking decisions that he thinks are right uh, based on the evidence he has in England, and I, I don't question his right to do that um, because I can't have it both ways. I can't say that I have to be able to do that for Scotland if I then question his decisions in, in England. Uh, so I respect his right to make those decisions. I do think he has, I would say, two things. I think it's important on all of us when we make decisions, we communicate them clearly and be clear to people what we're asking them to do and not do. And I'm not sure in England today that is necessarily as clear as it could be. Uh, when we make decisions, we think about the practical implications of those and any guidance that needs to be in place. We make sure that's in place before we, we make the decisions about the changes. And thirdly, for all of us, but again, because of his position as Prime Minister of the UK, it's particularly important for, the, for, for Boris Johnson. When we are announcing decisions that are only for one part of the UK, we're clear about that and don't give the impression that they are for uh, every part of the UK. And I think if, if we all uh, do that in good faith, and I... I do believe we're all acting in good faith right now, but if we all take care to do these things, then confusion around these things is not inevitable. And I go back to the point I've made twice already today, the media have a role to play in this as well. And I think the media by and large are doing that well, but I think there is always uh, a need for all of us to remind ourselves of that uh, obligation to be as clear as possible in a situation that everybody accepts is very uncertain and very difficult. Uh, Severin Crell from The Guardian. Sorry, good morning, First Minister. Um, just dealing with this new five-tier alert system that the Prime Minister unveiled yesterday, is the Scottish Government going to be using it? Have you been asked to use it? And are you contributing to any policy decisions about implementing it in Scotland? What's the position? Um, I cannot answer that definitively right now because I haven't yet seen the detail of it. I, I hope we will see the detail of that later today and we will certainly consider very carefully uh, whether that is appropriate uh, and fits within the decision-making process that we set out in our first paper, what, two or three weeks ago now. So I, I certainly am not... Uh, uh, I'm not in any way turning uh, my mind against using it. It may well be a very helpful uh, tool to use to judge the decisions we take and, and the way in which we phase those decisions. But we, we will have to look at it, I think, a bit more closely before we can come to a definitive decision on that. Um, certainly, I, I can't remember, Seb, if you were on uh, the, the call, the uh, update yesterday, but a question was asked about the biosecurity centre that has been proposed by the UK government, which is what the, the data will feed into that then allows us to, to make some of these decisions. And we are very keen, there are some details of that again still to be shared, but if possible, we're very keen to contribute to that. So, you know, we are absolutely open to anything. I, I do think ideally it would be good if the whole UK had the same uh, 
you know, system of phasing, maybe not exactly the same dates and timescales, uh, depending on the evidence, but the same general approach. And we will certainly be very open to, to looking uh, at what the UK government uh, publishes later on today. Uh, Gregor, do you want to add anything on the, the sort of clinical aspects of that kind of approach? Yeah, so, so as the First Minister's outlined there, I think there's lots about the high-level proposal that we've heard that, that are of real interest and the ability to be able to share data and understand from that data and, 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 and speak with consistency across the four nations is really important. Um, but, but until we've had a chance to interrogate the, the detail of what the proposal involves and how that would link with some of the Scottish systems that we have, I don't think that we're in a position to be able to, to kind of say any more than it's of interest and, and, and that, that it's something that we would want to explore further. Certainly, uh, the comment I would make around about this is, is, is that the, both the CEMOs, the chief scientists and indeed chief nursing officers and clinical directors of each country have remained very close contact with each other from the beginning of this crisis and um, one of the, the important things during that um, th those conversations is to be able to compare data which is similar in its origin and, 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 and is um, directly comparable. I mean one of the things that I know this is what you're implying Seth but just a general uh, comment from me here you know I, I know there is a tendency and it's understandable to see the fact that we are taking slightly different approaches on different timelines in different parts of the UK as some kind of division or a breaking down of the Four Nations approach. And I really would ask people not to see it like that. I still am very keen to cooperate and collaborate as much as possible. I still think as much alignment as possible is really important, if not on the fine detail of the timing, if the evidence says otherwise, then in the overall approaches we're taking. So I will be looking to align our positions as much as possible. But of course, the, the decisions about the when and the what have to be guided by the science and the evidence as it applies here in Scotland. Uh, Tom Gordon from the Herald. Thank you, First Minister. Um, you said uh, many times over the past few weeks that you may take a different approach in Scotland if you consider decisions made in England to be premature. Do you consider what's happening at the moment in England as premature, given our border with England is completely open and we have less headroom in Scotland in terms of the R number? We have smaller margin for error if there is an uptick in infection. Um, I, I'm not trying to so I, I would ask you to listen carefully to what I say here because I'm not trying to, to be difficult or obtuse I, I it's not for me to judge whether these actions are premature in England that, that's for Boris Johnson to judge but the actions he has announced in England I think right now are premature for Scotland um, and that's why I am not taking the same steps right now now I said I think last week you know, within a four nations approach, which, you know, the four nations approach is still there in terms of trying to collaborate, we can either have an acceptance, a pragmatic acceptance, that the evidence might put us all onto slightly different timelines, which is, I think, what we've got now, or you can all decide to go at the pace of the slowest, just to use that terminology for ease of, of understanding. Um, so I think where we've got to now is an acceptance that we might move at different speeds depending on the evidence. And, and I can't judge the right speed for England, but it is my responsibility to judge the right speed for Scotland. So these restrictions, easing of restrictions that Boris Johnson has announced, in my judgment, are premature for Scotland. I hope the judgment this time next week on some of them might be different and this time two weeks from now might be different still. Uh, but right now, I think our progress is too fragile for us to ease up to the extent that he has decided uh, to do in England. Although I should say, uh, for the benefit of anybody watching in England, uh, the lockdown is still in place in England. These are differences of degree. They are not fundamental differences of approach. Uh, Simon Johnson from The Telegraph. Um, the exercise rules have been relaxed in England today, meaning, meaning people can drive to other destinations for a walk. Um, this change has prompted the Welsh Government's Council General to issue a warning today to people from England not to drive into Wales for exercise crossing their border. But uh, Welsh police chiefs have said it's going to make their jobs a lot, lot harder in terms of policing that border. I just wondered if you had any concerns about these rules changing and whether it may require an increased uh, police presence at the Scottish border. 
Uh, no, I, I don't think, although that would be an operational matter for the Chief Constable, not for me, but I, I don't think there is any uh, plan or uh, considered uh, need for increase, increased policing at the Scottish border. You heard uh, the Chief Constable when he joined me last Friday at the Daily Update saying, yes, of course, these things may always you know, increase the scale of the challenge the police are facing with, but he didn't think there was any fundamental issue in terms of policing and used the example of uh, differences in the law already north and south of the border. You know, if you're driving across the England-Scottish border, you've got a different drink drive limit when you cross uh, into Scotland. So the police are used to, to policing in that way. On the, the more substantive part of your question, I'd be very clear to, to people who might be watching in England, it is not okay to drive uh, into Scotland to beauty spots, to go um, and uh, you know, visit places and to, to do uh, leisure activities, uh, because that is not yet permitted in Scotland. You can exercise as often as you like every day, but you have to stay within the vicinity of your own home. Um, I, I guess if you're living right on the England-Scotland border, you can uh, come into Scotland for your daily exercise, but driving places to, to beauty spots is not allowed in Scotland. And, and that is not allowed for people living in Scotland, and it is not at this stage allowed for people coming into Scotland either. Uh, Stuart Patterson from the Evening Times. Good afternoon, First Minister. Um, there seems to be capacity to test a lot more people than are currently being tested. Do you want to see more people who are eligible booking a test at one of the, the test centres, for example, at Glasgow Airport, if they have symptoms? And given we have that spare capacity, is it now time to be extending it out to the wider population who have symptoms? Uh, well, we are uh, progressively clinically driven extending uh, testing uh, as we, we go along with the management of, of this virus. Uh, in answer to your first question, yes, if, if you are eligible for a test and if you fit the criteria, then yes, go on and book uh, a test at one of the drive throughs or at one of the mobile uh, testing units. Uh, so I, I would certainly encourage uh, people to do that, obviously, if they fit uh, the, the criteria that are set down. Uh, we continue to increase testing capacity and actual tests. Um, as I said a couple of weeks ago, there will always be a difference between capacity and use for a variety of good reasons. There will also always be a difference between the number of tests we do on a daily basis and the number of people tested, because often people need more than one test, again, for clinical reasons. Jean, do you want to say any more about uh, the work we're doing around testing? As the First Minister has said, <clears throat> we've extended uh, the testing we do, particularly uh, into care homes. So uh, where a uh, care home has an active case, uh, all staff and residents uh, should be tested. That may include uh, residents or staff who don't have symptoms and for whom the test comes back as negative. That means that we will continue to test those individuals. And the advice is that that would be, uh, broadly speaking, twice in any week. So testing in those situations uh, is iterative uh, and isn't a one-off event. In addition, there is a sample testing in those care homes with no active uh, case of the virus in order to allow us to keep a watch on uh, the situation in those care homes and protect them as far as possible uh, from acquiring a case. Of course, testing isn't the primary way in which you protect uh, a care home from acquiring a case. Good barrier nursing, good infection prevention and control, proper PPE, the right staffing levels, and staff having the skills and the confidence uh, to undertake all of that work is absolutely critical, which is why our public health directors are so actively engaged. But in addition, we've also extended testing to all individuals over 70 who are admitted to hospital for any reason. Again, that is part of our surveillance work. Uh, and as the First Minister said, in terms of testing through the drive through centres and the mobile testing units, that, of course, has also now been extended to uh, individuals who are over 65 who have symptoms uh, that they then require a test. They can book that online. And any individual not in our key worker category, but who cannot work from home, who also has symptoms, they too can book a test through uh, the online portal. Thank you. Uh, Mark McLaughlin from The Times. Hi there. Um, this morning on TV, you said that until we find a vaccine or new treatments or antibody tests to find out if there is immunity, we're going to have to learn to, to live with this virus. It's maybe one for the, the CMO. 
in the early part of this outbreak, Catherine Calder would used to give us estimates of how many people she thought had been infected. Uh, I think it was about 65,000 at the start. Bear in mind what the First Minister said about publishing the R rate. Will you now tell us how many people you think have been infected? I know some modelers are saying the infection fatality ratio is about 0.6%. So kind of back of a fag packet calculation of the number of deaths would suggest close to half a million people. I mean, is that the ballpark you're looking at? I had a word to put Gregor on the, the question of how we tell how many people have been uh, infected, and I'm not sure, Gregor can say, I'm not sure we can say that yet with with certainty. On the, the, the figures about um, how many people are uh, here and now, I mean, uh, Dr Calderwood uh, used to give these estimates based on an extrapolation from, uh, I think, people in ICU and people who were dying. Uh, we now have uh, the ability to model that uh, a bit more uh, precisely. So in the, the paper we published last week, we said that the estimate then was that around 26,000 people in Scotland at that point were infectious uh, with or infected uh, with the virus. But that is a, a here and now figure. It's one of the things we'll be looking at closely over the next period. Uh, I will now hand over to Gregor, who's uh, much more able than I am to talk about how you assess almost retrospectively what proportion of the population uh, will have had the virus. Well, Dr Calderwood gave those estimations um, in the early part of the pandemic. They, they were extrapolations, and they were extrapolations based on data that we had from other sources, largely from, um, sadly, the number of deaths we had at that point in time in the epidemic, and, and, and also the number of um, um, cases of people who went to intensive care units. As we go through the epidemic, that, that, that becomes much less reliable as a source of estimation for, for how much of the population um, has actually experienced this and, and the, the, the best way that we can now calculate what proportion of the, uh, the, the population has been exposed to coronavirus is through some of the emerging technologies in serology testing and um, already we're starting to get some results back from the early population serology testing that we're doing across the country. Um, I have to say that there are a number of different labs that are looking at this just now, but particularly um, the Scottish uh, National Blood Transfusion Services have, have got some early data that's not able to be published at this moment in time yet, but it's certainly giving us an indication as to um, what proportion of the population may have been exposed. And this is the important part, has been able to form antibodies to uh, the coronavirus as well. And in time, once that uh, data has uh, is in a state which is able to be is verified and able to be published. Um, I'd be happy to speak about that more. Okay, thanks, uh, Muir Dickey from the Financial Times. Thank you. Uh, you said uh, that you want to be very open and transparent about the all important R number. Um, why has the government not been able to share details of how it's calculating the R number and what data that's based on? And do you think that is something that you will be able to publish in the near future? Um, I think we are trying to do that. I mean, it's as you will appreciate, it's, it's, it's quite technical, but I think we, Gregor and I were talking this morning about uh, both publishing um, more of an explanation of that, but also perhaps um, offering uh, an off-camera sort of technical briefing with journalists who are interested, with people who are much more qualified than I am to talk about it in detail. So we can certainly look to arrange that and, and put out there as much, you know, it's calculated... Uh, Correct me if I'm wrong here, Gregor, in the same way in Scotland as it will be in any other country. So it's it's a, a sort of complicated uh, approach that takes account of, of case numbers and, and death numbers. But we will look to see what we can do to, to deepen uh, the understanding of just how that number is arrived at. And we'll get back to you on that uh, as quickly as possible. Um, Tom Martin from the Daily Express. Hi, First Minister. Um, both yourself and your party colleagues at Westminster had obviously previously uh, called for health checks and quarantine measures at ports and borders, at, at UK borders. And um, just given that, I just wonder how you feel about the deal that has been struck with France in that between the UK and France, there will be no 14 day re self isolation requirement when, when you're coming in or coming into each other's respective countries. Do you have any concerns over that issue? I don't yet know 
all of the detail of what uh, will be put in place instead of that in terms of people coming uh, from France to the UK or vice versa. I certainly understand there's going to be some kind of working arrangement that will be an alternative to that. But obviously, I, I want to, to understand the detail of that. I mean, I should say none of us want, I, I certainly don't want to have uh, checks at the border and people having to go into quarantine for any longer than is necessary. I'd rather not have that for, for anybody coming from anywhere. I think my views on Scotland being an open, welcoming country that, you know, is is happy to welcome people from all parts of the world are, are very well known. But this is an essential part of our approach uh, to, to continuing to suppress this virus. And it's an approach that other countries are taking as well. You know, obviously the exemption for the common travel area with Ireland, I, I think is important in terms of the, the free movement across our islands. But on the issue with France, I, if, if you forgive me, I, I want to see a bit more of the detail about what is proposed to operate in place of uh, the arrangements that will operate for everybody else. Uh, Derek Healy from The Courier is the final question. Thank you, First Minister. Kate Forbes and Fiona Hislop wrote to the Chancellor last week seeking assurances that Scottish workers will not be disadvantaged when the UK government begins to wind down its job retention scheme. Uh, given some workers in England are now being urged to return to work at a different place, sorry, a different pace from their counterparts in Scotland, have you received any assurances that the furlough scheme will remain in place here longer than in other parts of the UK, if that's necessary. Well, these, these discussions are all discussions that we have on an ongoing basis. I, I, I don't know yet whether there's been a, a reply to that letter. We can certainly uh, check that out, although I, I do understand that all parts of government, Scottish, UK, are extremely busy with, with dealing with all of this right now. What I would say is we want the financial arrangements to be in place for as long as necessary, not just in Scotland, but across the UK. And I think there is a recognition on the part of the Treasury uh, that uh, we shouldn't have cliff edges in that. And if we have different parts of the UK on slightly different timelines, then the, the schemes have to recognise that as well. I suppose the one thing I would say here, though, is I don't think anybody is anticipating or certainly not from my perspective, wanting it to be the case that businesses are closed in Scotland for a lot longer than they are in other parts of the UK. You know, we are hopefully going to keep any uh, time differences like that to a minimum. It's got to be driven by evidence, but we're not, I certainly hope we're not talking uh, about, you know, months of a difference here. These are likely to be quite fine uh, margins uh, and relatively in the scheme of things, small differences. And I, I think it's important that as I say, as I will continue to do, that it's vital that we take these decisions in Scotland in an evidence-based way. I also don't inadvertently give people the impression that we're going to see you know, bigger differences than I hope in reality will turn out to be the case. But we will keep all of these things under uh, close ongoing review. Um, that concludes the questions uh, for today. Can I thank Gregor and uh, Jean for joining me? Can I thank Jill, our sign language interpreter, today for her assistance in making uh, this uh, update accessible? Thank the journalists for the questions, as always, and thank all of you. Um, I really do appreciate the way in which uh, people across Scotland have listened to the advice that the Scottish Government has given and complied with that advice. It is that that has meant that we have made the progress we've made. You keep hearing me say, and Gregor and Jean say, that the R number is not low enough yet, but the R number is a lot lower now than it was a few weeks ago. And that is only because we've all been doing the right thing. If we keep doing the right thing, then we will get it lower, we will get much more headroom in dealing with this virus, and we will start to be able to ease up these restrictions in a way that is safe and doesn't risk an immediate resurgence of the virus. That's what all of this is about. I, I've said before, I don't want these restrictions to be in place for any longer than is necessary, but equally, I don't want on your behalf to lift them uh, before we can be confident that it doesn't do more damage than good. So these are the principles that will continue uh, to guide us. Uh, I will continue to work hard to make it clear uh, to people in Scotland what I'm asking you to do uh, and what I'm asking you not to do. I'll uh, be making a televised address uh, on BBC One at five to six this evening to again just take the opportunity to get these messages across and I will end with the point I made in my opening statement today. We are all desperate to get back to 
normality, to be able to see our families and do all of the things that are part of our everyday lives. And if we stick with it now for a bit longer, that day will come along sooner. If we take our foot off the brake too quickly, that day will be further away. So thank you everybody for what you are doing uh, and please keep doing it and keep listening to the advice from the Scottish Government, NHS Inform uh, website is always a good uh, source of advice if you need any more detail. We'll be back here uh, tomorrow at the usual time of 12.30 and in the meantime, thank you all very much for joining us.